Welcome, and thank you for joining AIA Virginia's Historic Resources Committee this afternoon for the webinar, Making the Case for Historic Window Restoration. I am Susan Reed, the Director of Historic Preservation at Glave and Holmes Architecture in Richmond, and I'm the Chair of the Historic Resources Committee. The mission of the Historic Resources Committee is to identify, understand, and preserve architectural heritage within the Commonwealth of Virginia. We promote the role of historic preservation, rehabilitation, and adaptive use within the profession through the development of information and knowledge among members, allied professional organizations, and the public. And this webinar is an example of how we are reaching out to address important issues in our field. And in this case, it's saving historic windows rather than replacing them. We have assembled an expert panel for you on this crucial topic. And to start off, we'll be hearing from Ashley and Summer. And Summer does not have video, so you will hear her, but just see her name. And then we will hand it over to Greg, who will moderate a discussion with our window restoration specialists, Dixon and Brooks. And then, as Rhea mentioned, we will have time to take additional questions from you, so please use the uh, feature. And keep an eye on the chat throughout for links that we'll be sharing with helpful resources and additional information. So we're ready to get started with Ashley. Hello. Thanks, Susan. Can you see me? Hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you. So. My name is Ashley Wilson, as introduced, and for the last 10 years, I'm a preservation architect. I've worked at the National Trust for Historic Places as, sorry, the National Trust for Historic Preservation as their chief architect. And our portfolio of buildings spans between 1750 and 1950. And within all of those buildings, you know, it's, it's sort of a no brainer. Of course, we save our historic buildings because we're a preservation organization and we believe in saving historic fabric. And we also really believe in supporting the preservation trades network. But even though we have those buildings and I'll show you a couple of case studies and all different types of windows, we also have a lot of non-contributing historic buildings on our properties that I manage. And it's these non-contributing historic buildings that I get the question that I think the, pop, the general population is really dealing with, which is we want to change the windows out. And can we change the windows out? And the answer is, of course not. And the question usually comes from because we haven't taken good care of them and we think we can find something that has, you know, that's um, a better conservation solution or better for, you know, the green movement. And my answer always is, hey, this is a preservation organization, but it's also the most environmentally conscious thing you can do is take care of what you already have. But before we even get into that conversation, I just wanted to pull back with these two images to talk about how windows are the souls of our buildings, that they probably are the one most character defining feature that changes how that building is perceived from the world from the outside and from your view from the inside out. So these two images, the one on the left is in Georgetown, the one on the right is in Old Town. Um, you, can, you can see that the win windows themselves aren't even working alone. It's not just the window, but you have operable shutters from the outside that can be closed in, in or out to make the building more soundproof, it can make the building have more ventilation when you don't want people looking into your window, but you also have internal shutters as shown on the image on the right that can be used the same way to control the sun, the solar glare. And so we are, have these windows with the beautiful attenuated tight muttons. You can see they're very narrow here, less than um, half of an inch, some of them even smaller than that. And then the glass with the some of this glass is old, some of it's new, it's been replaced with the wavy glass. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. So here's just another image identifying sort of the character defining charm of having your historic windows. The one on the left is actually an interesting example because here in Alexandria, Virginia, 
there is a tradition of using black glazing compound, which makes the window muttons look even narrower. So the one on the left, you can see very, very narrow because the glazing compound it disappears, but it also has the added advantage of when biological growth shows up, which it does on windows every few years, you can't see it because it's already black, but the one in the white is right. Um, next slide. So I also have this distinct position with historic windows because I serve on the old Georgetown board, which is the architectural review agency for Georgetown. And Georgetown is one of these historic communities that like Charleston, Newport, Rhode Island, Old Town Alexandria has the biggest collection of intact 18th, 19th, and 20th century buildings. And the reason we have such a deep collection is because it's so overly regulated with review boards. These review boards have been there since the 1950s, really controlling when windows are changed out. And I put this example up, it's a new window in a new building, but I put it up just to point out a couple of things to you. And the old Georgetown board has a lot of guidelines, but I wanted to point out, so this is, as I said, a, it's a new building in the historic district and it's a new window and it's a very high-end window. This window probably costs more than $2,000, but the blueness of it, that's from the low E glass. And so the Georgetown board doesn't like low E glass that has this sort of blue glare to it because it really does change how it looks. But you can also see it's the thickness of the mutton on the inside, which here is black, which is another requirement of the old Georgetown board is that it's a darker color, not a lighter color, but there's two planes of glass. So you have like a sandwich of glass and that's why that mutton bar gets so thick. So those are the things that we're always trying to sort of work on. So I said, this is the best you can get in a reproduction window. And it's still to sort of a professional eye looks squeaky clean. And this, built, this window has burn for it. It has a very expensive um, molding around it. So it fits into the window well. Um, and then I'll point out one of the problems of this window too, which is why we don't like replication or replacement windows is even with the expense, the weakest link on this whole window unit is the caulk in the ceiling. And those will fail. There is no doubt they will fail and they usually fail within 10 or 15 years. And then you will get moisture in between those two panes of glass and that moisture will start changing how this, building is and it will fail. And so this window, no matter how much it costs, does not have the simplicity of these historic windows that are just much more simple in their construction and craftsmanship. Next slide. So here's an example for the same cost. So this is a 1805 window. It's at Woodlawn in Alexandria. It was William Thornton building, the building, the window on the left is the before and the one on the after, on the right is the after, of course. But this window had not been restored for 200 years, which it held up pretty well. And it was such a major restoration, these were actually taken out and then done in a shop, but for the same cost. I think these, and these are very large windows. They are know, five feet by nine feet tall. Um, the most expensive window was 20. 2100, 2200 to restore. So for the same price, we of course have this amazing material, but what we learned when we took it into the craftsman's um, workshop is you have this old Virginia longleaf pine that is why the wood has managed to do so well, even without being cared for. And for many years before Woodlawn was under National Trust ownership, it had a lot of owners that would take care of it, not take care of it, take care of it, not take care of it. So you have this incredible first growth wood that is very strong and is bug resistant and water resistant. And you had the interior and you had the exterior um, shutters that also protected it over time. So now we'll take the next slide. This is again at Woodlawn. But I wanted to show you sort of an example of the different levels of window restoration we do. So you have like that major window, which needed a whole generational refresh. And so it went into the carpenter's shop. So he removed it from the site and worked on it where he had all of his tools and his craftsmen and he could work on it. We have some other windows from the 19th century or um, 1916, sorry, 20th century that were in better shape. And so we actually repaired those on site, which is what you're looking at here is um, 
and they only need like some small Dutchman work, some sanding, some repainting, some new weather stripping. Um, then we also have windows. And this is sort of what every, like our general maintenance policy is an exterior window every five to seven years needs a fresh coat of paint, especially the Southern elevations need a fresh coat of paint. But then after 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we find that our windows get painted shut. And so when the windows get painted shut, then we do like another layer of intervention. And so when we go back, we'll send carpenters and we'll ask them to rehang basically. We want them to unstick the windows so they're operable again. And then to make sure that, especially with, and this is with sash windows, that the um, weights are working correctly. And our um, specification is anybody should be able to open a window using two fingers only. And so they rebalance the weights and then they weather strip them and they put them back in. So we have 10 years of painting, 30 to 40 years of replacing in situ, a little bit longer, they come out in the site, even every hundred years, we have them go to a shop. Next slide. We also have in our collection metal windows and metal, the, this is actually the Fernsworth house that you're looking at. So it's arguably the world's most important modern building in its 1950s. And it is, um, if you know anything about Farnsworth House, it floods all the time. <laughs> it's, on the, it's on the bank of a river. And so you have um, these steel frames that have just deteriorated. And so when we restore these, we actually, um, there's no way, when, once it starts rusting, you have to re-roll it. So that we re-rolled it and we have new steel frames there. But the big issue with our um, modern buildings and these steel buildings is, is the glass actually because all of the glass that was in these buildings is not to code, which is quite dangerous. These are small museums. And if um, the wind blows or a child hits it or something falls over when the glass breaks, it, um, it's catastrophic and it's in shards and it drops down. So we, what we do, because we always want to retain historic fabric in that very early 1950s glass is as straight, it's the opposite of 19th century windows. It's as straight and perfect as can be, which is really important in a modern building. And so what we do is we put on um, a safety film on the original. And then when we replace it, we look for the flattest, cleanest piece we can at these large sizes. And at Farnsworth House, we had no room in the window pocket to get a bigger piece of glass. So we could not use laminated. So we worked with um, tempered glass and we could find some tempered glass that was very straight to replace them with. Next slide. So sort of back to the front about the biggest argument for replacing windows is always the conservation argument. And so the best article I've ever read for the layperson is this one that was in Forbes magazine, which is um, a very clear sort of gimlet eye of just the cost of replacing and why it doesn't make any sense. And so that's a great starting place. It's also really important when you're working on windows to look if you're in the historic district that has a review board, you need to look at your review board's policies and see what they allow. Some review boards don't like replacement on the front facade, but on the rear facades or the side facades, you're allowed to replace and they'll walk you through that. Next slide, please. But what we realized at the National Trust is we needed to do our memberships a big service because the people who are pushing replacing windows are the people who are selling windows. And there was no counter voice. There's the tradespeople who are here, but so the National Trust had, um, it used to be called Preservation Green Lab. It's now called the Research and Policy Lab because we do much more than just sustainability issues. But we did a large report and it's got a summary and executive summary and different tidbits, but it's this image on your left, saving windows, saving, saving money. But what they did is they went through, they actually didn't just do it all in um, a factory, but they got a prototype building in Portland, Oregon. And then they used that prototype building and they sort of simulated the rest in five different cities around the country. And they ran the numbers to figure out like, what are you getting? Because every environment, every climate is different with your historic window and what benefits would you get by doing different types of retrofit and then comparing that to a new window. And of course, like once you really put the science to it, it just makes sense. Like, why would you take 
fantastic looking original early craftsmanship and replace it with something that no matter how much you spend is still machine manufactured and has too many parts and they're going to fail. And so it's a great report, but it basically says of all the things you do in your historic building, replacing the windows is the very last resort to save energy. And that there's many other things you can do to your window to improve its performance by fixing the weather stripping, using your interior shutters, you can use interior storms. It, it lists it all out, but it says, you know, spend some money insulating your attic before you rip out the windows on your historic building. And then of course, there's also the preservation briefs, which are a fantastic guide. And I'll take the next slide. So this is the line of defense I tell everybody that it's so easy, which is if you weather strip your window, it's going to perform so much better than you think it, it is now if you're complaining about how they work now. Um, if you don't have interior storms, like in those images that we showed you, there are many companies who do make interior storms. I prefer, you can do an exterior storm or an interior. I prefer interior storms because you can move them. They're easier to move in and out when you want to open the windows in the shoulder season. And Virginia's are very like big spring, big fall. You want to use your windows. And then I cannot say enough about number three. If you regularly maintain a historic window, it will last forever. It has no end to how long it will last. And so that is the direction we at the National Trust always like to say is take care of your historic stuff and it will take care of you. So I think that is my final slide. I will see you all in the chat. Thanks, Ashley. Um, can everyone hear me? This is Summer Lauthan. Yeah, you sound great. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna build off of Ashley's presentation, but kind of talk about how um, myself, I'm a tax credit reviewer at the Department of Historic Resources and how we review um, and look at the preservation of historic windows using the standards. Um, through the tax credit program. We'll move on to the next one. So the state and federal historic rehabilitation tax credit is a useful incentive to encourage preservation of the state's historic resources. Um, through the programs, property owners are given substantial incentives for private investment and preservation. Um, and both the federal and state tax credit programs are administered in Virginia through the Department of Historic Resources. And I know we may have some people that are on here from out of state um, and it may be dependent on the state that you're in and whether or not you have your own state tax credits. Go on the next. So the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties address four different treatments. There's preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. The rehabilitation standards acknowledge the need to alter or add to historic buildings to meet continued or new uses while retaining the building's historic character. The standards provide direction in making appropriate choices in planning the repairs, alterations, and additions that may be part of a rehabilitation project and are regulatory for the historic tax credit program, which means if you're applying for the historic tax credits, you need to meet all 10 of the rehabilitation standards for your project to qualify for the credits. These standards guide our review of all tax credit projects and include including the treatment of historic windows. You can go to the next. While there are 10 rehabilitation standards, there are three specific standards that most apply to historic windows. Standard two states that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. Mm -hmm. Removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Next. Standard five states the distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. Next. And so windows on many historic buildings are an important aspect of the architectural character of those buildings. Their design, craftsmanship, and other qualities make them worthy of preservation. This is self-evident for ornamental windows, but can be equally true for warehouses or factories where the windows may be the most dominant visual element of an otherwise plain building as seen on the left. And next. And then lastly, there's standard six, which applies directly to the repair or replacement of historic features. Standard six states that deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities 
and where possible materials. A place for the missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. Next. And so the guidance for rehabilitation begins with the least amount of intervention with the recommendation to protect and maintain historic features. This may include ensuring that historic windows are painted or windows are protected from damage during construction or vandalism if the building is to remain vacant for a time. Next, when the physical condition of a window warrants additional work. Oh, sorry, <laughs> go back a slide. That, that wasn't the next I needed. Next, when the physical condition of windows warrant additional work, repair is recommended. Repair can include renewal of finishes, material repair using epoxies, replacement of component parts, and additions such as weather stripping. While it may be possible to repair even severely de deteriorated windows, repair of deterioration beyond a certain level may not be practical or reasonable and replacement becomes the appropriate treatment at that time. Our office only approves replacing of an entire character defining feature such as windows if the level of deterioration or damage of materials precludes repair. Next. Determination as to when deterioration is sufficiently severe to justify replacement must be based on documentation of the conditions of the windows. What can co constitutes effective documentation may vary with the circumstances of the project, but at a minimum must include good quality photographs that clearly depict the full range of conditions. Um, usually we get photos that aren't very clear. We need very good photos that show clear conditions of windows. Um, showing deterioration, uh, reports sometimes from contractors or window experts. Um, we may require, um, you know, an attempt to repair to show um, what level of work is required to repair the windows. Um, you can go to the next slide. And I know that this is a win uh, talk about preserving windows, but I wanted to go a little bit into re replacement windows just to show the level that is needed um, of detail for those new windows um, in order to be able to approve their choice. Um, as you saw in, in Ashley's presentation, a new window, even an expensive new window, may not be an adequate um, replacement uh, for that historic window. So when windows are deteriorated beyond repair, they must be replaced to match. Placement windows must match the original in size, pane configuration, color, trim details, and planar and reflective qualities, and in most cases, materials. Here are the next slide. Scaled drawings comparing the existing historic windows with proposed replacement windows must be provided. Deep drawings sh should show the elevation, horizontal, and vertical sections of the existing and proposed windows. Drawings should include muttons, mullions, transoms, and other window components and scale should be provided, measurements noted, and materials indicated for the main components of the window. Drawings of existing historic windows must be accurate and based on field measurements. So on the next slide, you can see um, in these comparative drawings, the, the window on the left is an original historic window, the window on the right is a proposed replacement window, and you can clearly see just looking at the top rail that this would not be an adequate replacement for that historic window. You're the next. And so I'll just show a few comparative windows of concerns with replacement windows, um, just to really show the things that, that we are worried about when people are proposing replacement windows and how in some cases, just minor alterations or changes in measurements in a window and a new window can significantly change the look of um, what the historic window looked like. So for this, these photos here, um, show that substantial changes in the dimension and profiles of elements that frame a window can change its character. Um, the left window is the historic window and the right window is the replacement. This replacement window does not adequately fill the historic opening. It is a much smaller window and they just framed it in. Not to mention the fact that the historic window was a two over two window and this is a one over one. You know the next one. And these two photos on the left, the difference in the sash is the reason that these two replacement windows look different. On the second floor, the top rail of the top sash is roughly equal to the dimensions of the styles, which are on the sides of the sash, um, which is typical for most historic wood windows. The first floor windows have styles that are wider than the top of the rail, which gives it a kind of a skinny, narrow look as opposed to the historic window above. On the right, you see a modern replacement unit using insulated glass with true divided lights on the bottom, 
which has required larger muttons, which is than what is typical of historic muttons as seen in the original double hung window above. Next slide. And then lastly, here's another example that shows that while true divided lights in new historic windows can be fabri fabricated by some manufacturers to come very close to the dimensions of historic muttons, even small increases in size are perceptible. Um, you can tell in that historic window that isn't repaired at, and on the left, um, how kind of thin and narrow the muttons are. And then the replacement windows on the right, um, we have a much chunkier window in that photo. So in the next slide, so closing, historic windows often play an important role in the architectural character of a historic building and are worthy of preservation because of this. Following the Secretary of the Interior standards, retention and repair of historic windows should always be the priority in a rehabilitation project. Windows should only be replaced if their condition is such that it is warranted, but any replacement windows must accurately replicate the historic windows, um, which is oftentimes difficult to do. These are just a few resources available from, oh, sorry, next slide. Um, here's a couple of resources available from the Technical Preservation Services Office of the National Park Service. Um, I suggest exploring their website for additional publications on historic windows and other preservation topics. Um, there's a load of resources on their website. And next. And then lastly, um, if you wanted to contact our office to find out any more information on the tax credit program, um, you can contact Chris Novelli in our office. He is our tax credit specialist and he's kind of the first point of contact. Um, if you're interested in doing a tax credit um, project or finding out more information on the application process. And then I suggest going to our website there at the bottom um, to learn more about the tax credit program, but also to go to learn about all the other programs that our office um, manages. And with that, I'll hand this over to, to Greg for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Summer. Thank you, Ashley, um, for being with us today and sharing these perspectives from the National Trust and the Department of Historic Resources. Uh, Ashley, I love your philosophy of simplicity. I think that's kind of at the core of my practice as well. And some are uh, always revering this, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. That's at the core of what we do. So uh, this is great information. It's going to be a great springboard for our panel discussion. I'm sure we're going to revisit some of the points you've made during our discussion. As Susan mentioned at the very beginning of our program, our, our aim today is for you, our viewers out there, to arm you with some knowledge uh, so you can be an advocate to make a case for window restoration when you're faced with the dilemma of repair versus replacement. We have two experts in the field of window restoration with us today, and each of them could give us an hour-long presentation on what they do and how they do it. And hopefully one day in the future, we can convince them to come back and do that for us. I know I'd be fascinated learning more about the processes that are involved to restore a window. But today we're gonna to be talking about things in a big high level context. Uh, we've prepared about a half a dozen questions based on arguments that we hear all the time about replacing historic windows. And we want to pose those questions to our panelists and give them an opportunity to express to you, our audience, that the restoration of historic windows is practical, achievable, and historically appropriate. We've allowed about 45 minutes for this segment. I'm gonna keep an eye on the time, a close eye on the time, uh, because we do want to reserve some time at the end for questions and answers. So we may not get to all the questions, but we'll see how it goes. We'll play it by ear. So let me introduce you to our two panelists. First is we have Dixon Kerr. Uh, Dixon and I are both native Tennesseans and graduates from the University of Tennessee. So he has, he's gotta be a nice guy. Uh, he left his career in finance to pursue his passion in woodworking and decorative arts craftsmanship. He co-founded the Alliance to Conserve Old Richmond Neighborhoods and started his business, Old House Authority, where he restores 18th and 19th century windows and is an advocate for the preservation against overwhelming pressure to replace them. Next, we have Brooks Gentleman, who is with Review Window and Door Restoration. His company does both wood and metal restoration work, and he came highly recommended to us for his experience with metal, metal window restoration, so that's why he is here today. He has over 25 years of experience in windows and has spoken at several state and national preservation conferences on the topic of historic windows. Uh, welcome to both of you and thank you so much for being here. Um, Dixon and Brooks, could you uh, turn, uh, turn your cameras on please or do, are they on? I just can't see them. They're on. We're on. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. I'll see you now. Um, so 
again, welcome. And our first question really isn't a question at, at all, but since um, you both have specialized experience, I think it'd be interesting to start the discussion with each of you taking about five minutes to tell us a little bit about what you do, why you do it, uh, and what's involved in window restoration for both wood and uh, metal windows. Uh, so Dixon, uh, would you like to go first? Sure. I'm Dixon Kerr. I have a business in Richmond, Old House Authority Windows, and I've been restoring windows for about 25 years. I, it's changed a lot since we first started. Back then, not many people were restoring their windows, but the message has gotten out. People understand it a lot more now. And the problem is that there's more people wanting windows restored than there are restorers to do it. That's, that's changed completely. Part of it is the more expensive uh, window replacements are out there and lots of people think that it costs less now to restore the actual window that you have than buying a new one. Um, my, there are a lot of points I would have about why you would bother restoring an, a vintage window, but my three main ones are the materials that were used in the original window, the craftsmanship that went into it, and the design of the window itself. Um, and the materials I'm going to repeat a lot of what Ashley said. I found myself shaking my head in agreement with a lot of things she said, but the materials were uh, uh, longleaf pine and old growth cypress as well. Both of them are extinct now. And if you want them in your windows, you have to restore them or have them made from salvage material. Um, they have a, a value because they're resistant to insects and water. Um, the other material in the window, of course, is the glass. And there's basically two types of old window glass. Um, cylinder glass came later, sometime after the Civil War. Uh, but the original, the original was uh, crown glass. And the crown glass, they had to make in smaller pieces. They couldn't make gla uh, crown glass big enough to make a one light. So that's why you see older windows have numerous uh, lights and like nine over nine, six over six, or 12 over 12. They had to have smaller pieces of it at that time. But they could, um, they could make the glass uh, with, the, with the old growth wood. The mullions were much thinner and they had a thumbnail profile, which people like. It, it's attractive from the outside of the house because that wood was so strong. I brought in one sash that we have in the shop right now. This is from a house uh, in 1822 uh, called Bellevue, Belleville, and it's in Warsaw, Virginia. This light, this, these windows had a lot of the, I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not, but they had a lot of the original crown glass in them. And if you have crown glass and we, any of the broken piece, pieces, we put cylinder glass to mix in. We took out all the old modern flat glass. But if you have crown glass and cylinder glass next to each other, you can identify the crown glass because it was twirled. When they took it out of the oven, they would put it on a stick and spin it. And so the glass actually turns in a, in a circular way, whereas the cylinder glass, the, the distortions are more straight. But they mix well together when you're restoring a window. So the materials, this is cypress. Um, and the, the joinery used in this window, these are uh, bridal joints at the bottom, You've got three mortise and tenons at the top. You can, with the mullions come through all the way through the top rail of, of the sash. You can see right here where they, where they come through. And that, that's, that's craftsmanship. And even on a 200 year old window, these joints are tight. Um, they just made them so well, it's, it's remarkable. I, I, they haven't changed at all. There's just the joinery is wonderful on these. Um, let's see, we've got bridal joints. Sometimes the top rail would be um, fixed with dovetail, sliding dovetail joinery. Um, it, it's whereas a modern a modern window would be mostly glued and stapled. And the glass on a modern replacement window, there'd be two pieces of glass with some gas in between them. And people call us all the time and say, we can't see out the windows anymore. And it's because after 
eight or 10 years, the gas escapes and, and moisture gets in there and you can't see out and you have to replace your replacement windows again. Some people say that's why they call them replacement windows because you have to continuously do it. <laughs> Dixon, that is a fantastic example of what the, Ashley was mentioning too about the longevity of the materials and the craftsmanship that goes in to the construction of the historic windows and why they last so long. Uh, Brooks, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, what you do? Yes, um, I'm Brooks Gentleman with uh, Review Windows. And uh, 40 years ago, I got into the window business uh, and uh, became a, uh, a window replacement company. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> replaced thousands of windows. Uh, the first home I owned had beautiful steel casement windows and I replaced them with aluminum clad Pella wood windows. And uh, so uh, I am a reformed uh, window restoration person and uh, uh, born again. Uh, and uh, the reason being the, uh, the windows that were made 50 plus years ago uh, are, are of much higher quality than anything that you can acquire new today. Uh, the, uh, one of the, the challenges that the window industry has today is they have, uh, uh, they're, they're extremely competitive. So they cut costs and uh, cut quality so that they can uh, compete in the industry. And uh, so most of the window manufacturers, their quality has actually gone down and they are fabricating windows that have a 20 to maybe 30 year lifespan. So you look at a window opening, a historic window opening that's been around for 75 plus years. And uh, the thought of replacing it with a 25 year window uh, just uh, seems to be uh, unpragmatic uh, at, uh, at best and irresponsible. Uh, and th that's why uh, over the last 28 years, review is focused on window restoration. We do uh, window restoration for wood, steel, and bronze windows. And we focus on large commercial landmarks uh, that, uh, that are historically significant. Uh, we uh, also manufacture replica wood windows uh, out of very high quality parts and they use the same joinery uh, as the um, as traditional windows so they can be maintained and uh, and uh, will last the hundred plus years uh, so um, uh, we're, we're I'm going to be talking about the steel window restoration and and, uh, and why it's important to uh, restore steel windows uh, rather than replace them and uh, what you see in the commercial industry primarily, if, it, if a steel window is replaced, it's typically replaced with either an existing a, a, a modeled steel window or uh, even more commonly with an aluminum window. And it is almost impossible to get an aluminum window to look just like the steel. Uh, and uh, you're replacing a steel window that uh, will literally last four or 500 years if it's maintained uh, with a 30 year product. Um, so uh, that's the main message here is, uh, is the practicality uh, of uh, retaining the original fabric uh, because of its superior design and uh, quality of manufacture. That leads right into our real first question here talking about longevity and practicality. Because I serve on my local review board here in Norfolk, Virginia. And we regularly receive applications to replace historic windows from homeowners and building owners, both wood and, and steel windows. And they always make their case that their existing window is so far gone, it cannot be repaired. It's just, it's just gone. I can't do anything with it. At what point do you determine how far is a window, how far gone is a window that it cannot be repaired? How do you evaluate that? Did I some you have to go first? Sure. Um, you can repair anything. You have to look at the cost. Is it worth to do it or not? And that's usually on the customer. As far as I go, I would make recommendations. Sometimes if a wood window is rotten, like if the, if the bottom rail, which would be usually the one that would sit in water, the wood rot, uh, that can be replaced fairly uh, easily. But sometimes that rot would wick up and it would affect the styles on the left and the right. And then it becomes a little more complicated. 
Um, but yes, they can be repaired. We get uh, people calling all the time to say their windows are awful, that they, uh, they want to replace them. We look at them and they're, they're not awful at all. They got lots of paint that can come off and um, clean the glass. And, and it's you know amazing how much better they can look with just a clean cleanup. So it's up to the customer if it's really bad, uh, how much, how far you would go to restore one. But often is the case that, that um, most windows can be restored. Okay, Brooks steel steel sort of rust instead of rots. How do you yeah. evaluate that? Yeah, well, I I'd say uh, uh, on the outset, uh, on most every project we work on, uh, the, uh, the the windows can be restored, and they look worse than they really are. And so people have the perception that the windows need to be replaced, and all they're really dealing with is paint failure and sealant failure. Uh, so uh, now, when do you do replacement versus uh, restoration? How far gone? It really depends on the structure uh, of the building that you're looking at. When we did the Virginia State Capitol, uh, you wanted to retain pretty much everything you possibly can. Uh, when you're talking about a 1,200 square foot bungalow, that's a little diff different deal. Uh, but, uh, but most uh, in the steel world, uh, it's, a, it's amazing what we can do to restore existing steel systems that have the appearance of being long gone. And our biggest criticism we've ever had is that our restored windows look like replacements almost because they look brand new. When we yeah. get done with them, uh, they, they look like new windows. Uh, it's uh, incredible. It still amazes me. Wow. I, I think I would take that as a compliment, really. Yeah. Um, okay, the, the other argument we get all the time is that my, my historic window has poor thermal performance, it's drafty, I would replace my windows to cut my maintenance costs, uh, and I know there's been several studies on this, lots of reports on this uh, topic. So from your experience, how do, I've got two questions for this one, how, how do historic windows perform thermally, and what are some of the tricks of the trade you all use to improve thermal performance when you are re rehabilitating historic window. Brooks, would you like to go first on this one? Yeah, it's, uh, this has become a bigger issue over the last 20 years and the uh, green movement adds fuel to the fire. Uh, and the uh, advertisement uh, by major window manufacturers that is misleading uh, where they'll quote 73% uh, of you know, uh, superiority in uh, energy performance, but it's really just uh, a, a single component like the glass is 73% more effective at solar heat gain coefficients. So it doesn't really relate to the, the, the uh, energy performance of the whole system. Now, what we do in the steel world, there are a number of ways they, uh, the uh, uh, interior or exterior storm window is an outstanding way to upgrade a steel window system. And uh, you can make an existing steel window be actually more energy efficient than uh, any modern, uh, you know, manufactured window if, uh, if that's your intent. Uh, we can also do some changes in glazing that, uh, that will improve the energy performance of a steel window. Either a, a low E, uh, and this would be a proper low E that doesn't have tints. Uh, or reflectance uh, in, a, in a laminated glass, or uh, we have used vacuum insulated glazing in steel windows, which is a 6.2 millimeter uh, insulated uh, panel, uh, and that's an effective way. So uh, steel windows can actually be made energy efficient, uh, even in a superior way to modern windows, if, uh, if that is the objective. Fantastic. Uh, Dixon? How do you handle thermal performance? Our choice of, of, of increasing thermal performance is to have an exterior storm window or secondary glazing as they call it. You would have the original window with a dead space in between and then your storm window. And we, we sell them uh, a couple of them that are uh, pre-approved by the National Park Service for historic districts and historic designated buildings. Um, they increase your efficiency at least as much as the existing windows. There's tons of studies out there people can look up. I won't go into that because it takes a lot of time, but they do increase the, the thermal performance. They also cut out noise. They, my main point is they protect 
the window that I've restored after after it's put back in by having an, ex, uh, an exterior storm window on there, it's going to last a long time as far as needing glazing or paint touch up. Um, you can also get uh, low E glass put in your storm windows, which is a, a good way, say for museums that, that need low E glass. Um, it's a lot better than putting a film or coating on the, on the old glass. So we, we recommend exterior storm windows. We're a little bit leery of interior ones. I've seen too many um, wooden windows that were rotten because the interior storm window failed lots of times. I could name some, but I, I better not. But they, some uh, historic buildings around town where they had, especially the Velcro ones that came early, the, the Velcro would loosen. So you get warm, moist air from inside the house. It gets trapped between the, the, um, the interior storm window and the wood window, and it causes mildew and then rot. So we like the exterior storm window and think that's the answer. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, discussion between interior and exterior storm windows, good, good bad, and the ugly about both. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about, just a little bit about weather stripping and how important that is for wood windows. Um, we, if, you're, if you're taking a window out, we have a, there's a Swedish weather stripping. We used to do it more in the beginning when we first started where you cut a, a thin dado on all around the wood window and uh, they have different sizes of this tubular weather stripping that snaps in. It's a, it's a Swedish material. It works well, but it's, it's not cost effective unless you're taking that window out to restore it. Uh, to take it out just to put the weather strip in and it gets expensive. So again, we recommend the exterior storm window. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. This might be going down a little bit of a slippery slope, but another reason we hear all the time is that uh, replacement windows are, are a lot less expensive than restoring historic windows because restoring my historic window is going to cost me a fortune. Uh, and it's, gonna, it's not going to be worth the cost. It's not going to last. We've already talked about longevity. So uh, I, I believe the, the historic windows last longer. Uh, but without getting into actual cost, how do you respond to that? I mean, assu and assuming the window is restored and maintained, what is sort of a reasonable expectation for its performance and lifespan? Uh, Dixon, would you like to go first on this one? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is, is it, um, it's changed like I said, from 25 years ago, now when people um, look at a house for sale, an old house, they want original windows, mainly because that improves a house's value. Uh, people are, are educated on windows now and they want the original fabric. And so it's an investment that improves the value of your house for one thing. So I, I would say that's the main reason people want them. Okay, Brooks, how do you address the cost of the restoration versus replacement? Well, the, uh, we, we did a job in Nashville years ago where uh, it was perceived that uh, replacement steel windows would be less expensive or the equivalent to the window restoration of the existing steel. And uh, the uh, replacement steel windows were actually double the cost. Uh, so. Uh, Steel window restoration is less expensive uh, than uh, re you know, replacement in steel. Now, when you uh, introduce an aluminum replacement, which is a whole different animal, and, uh, and that this puts you on the replacement treadmill where you're gonna be replacing the replacements, uh, they, they, uh, they, they can get competitive, uh, but uh, uh, you, we, we talk, we talk uh, value and original fabric and the original look of the building uh, and, uh, and other means for uh, energy efficiency that you can achieve with a replacement system. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going, I keep drawing on my architectural review board, maybe I, I'm trying to help them out here, but uh, one of the criteria that our, our board applies for evaluating replacement materials is if the historic material is still available or if craftspeople are around who can still work with the historic material. And Dixon, I think you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, can you all talk a little bit about your industry and how it's evolving? Uh, Dixon, you said it's becoming, the demand is becoming more than uh, you have resources to deal with. 
Is, it, is that the case with the steel windows as well? Can you just sort of give us a little uh, overview about what's going on in the world of window restoration? Brooks, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, uh, the, the, there, there, there are realities now from a labor standpoint, uh, that, and I think that every industry is uh, challenged by, and we are as well, finding a labor that can do the work. But uh, we are seeing a, uh, a movement currently uh, where the trades labor are gaining, uh, gaining in popularity because of the higher wages that, and uh, and, and we, we have a, a training program here at, uh, at Review where we can bring unskilled labor in and train them in what we do. Um, what we do isn't rocket science, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's more of a discipline that this takes some time to learn. Uh, we've also invest, invested in uh, CNC technology and automated technology that allows us to do some things that craftsmen once did. And uh, it, it, so, but that's how we address some of the changes that we've seen over the last 20 years in the industry. Okay. Dixon, are you worried, worried you not, might not be able to restore every window in Virginia? Uh, well, about 30 to 40% of the windows we look at that look awful actually don't need full restoration where you take them out and take them to the shop. A lot of them can use repair in place without taking them out. And we've trained uh, a group of painters to do that. Um, it's, it's not something where you'd, you'd have to take them out and put them in a steam box like we do for full restoration, but they can, they can uh, address uh, issues about the glazing falling out and cleaning the windows, replacing broken cords, that sort of thing, broken glass, um, and putting in good quality uh, wood, the putty the, for the glass. So a lot of it, people, if they're not in an area um, where there's a, a window restore, they can call a manager of, their, of a paint store and ask them if there are painters available in the area that know how to work on windows to do basic repairs. There's also a group in Massachusetts, um, Allison Hardy, who, if you've watched this whole house uh, television show, she always does the window restoration. Well, she's put together a group called the Window Preservation Alliance, and she's made a directory of all the people across the United States that do that type of work. And if you can go onto that website and, and find somebody possibly in your area to do a full restoration. Okay, that was the Window Preservation Alliance? Dot org, yeah. All right, that's fantastic. That's fantastic information. So either of you worried about your industry just sort of becoming a dinosaur? No, no, <laughs> no, no. I think the, uh, the, the trend over the last uh, 28 years has been uh, people are recognizing finally the value of historic windows. And uh, so uh, if anything, we uh, see a surge in demand and, uh, and we've also seen a surge in window restoration uh, contractors all over the country. That is really encouraging. That I is totally great. agree. Yeah, fantastic. All right, well, this is our last question, our last prepared question before we move on to questions and answers. I see we've got a, a few in our, our queue already. Um, as a preservationist, I'm always interested in retaining and maintaining the historic materials and using the historic building, uh, building techniques as well. But the construction industry is always evolving with new materials and new methods and project, uh, products, some that are environmentally sustainable and environmentally responsible. Is this sort of uh, movement uh, having an effect and an influence on what you do and the products you use, sustainable products and environmentally responsible products? Either one? Sure. Uh, Go ahead, Brooks. Oh, uh, you, we, we see it a lot in, uh, uh, in finishes and, uh, you know, VSC content of finishes in uh, uh, FSC requirements, forest, forest stewardship council requirements on wood. Uh, LEED has, uh, has run a lot of those sort of demands over the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, there, there, there is a, 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 a movement to that. And, um, and we're always looking for uh, more modern materials that can be used effectively in, uh, in the historic window market. And, and there are a few of them in, in glass, in woods, 
uh, in finishes, uh, in, uh, in glazing putties and, uh, and silicone. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure when you can effectively merge high tech with uh, the, uh, the historic uh, window arena. Okay, Dixon, thoughts? We use epoxies, which are fairly new. They were developed by you know the boat industry probably 40 years ago, but we use them on some repairs. We use a putty, which is um, a company that's are making the old fashioned putty out of based on linseed oil rather than soy oil like you would buy at, at the home store. Um, that's actually an old product that's come back around. There are companies making uh, blown glass again. There's a company in Germany that's, that's making uh, cylinder glass. And I hear there's a shop uh, now that whether uh, someone's uh, trying to make crown glass again. So there are, the people are getting back into it, you, mostly using remaking old products, but there are some new ones like the epoxies that we use. All right. Uh, before we turn it over to the question and answers, do you all have any other uh, thoughts or closing remarks you'd like to make? Just one. Um, when we restore windows, it's not just uh, um, high level houses that, that we do. A lot, there are a lot of um, houses that were built middle-class people you know, 100, 150 years ago. Those windows were made just as well as they were in the more elegant houses. And it's just as important for restorers to be working on them for people because that's usually in a neighborhood where there's a cluster of old houses and you don't want a lot of them with replacement windows. It just, it looks like a tooth gone out of, of someone's mouth when you got bad windows mixed in with good ones. So it's, it's important to do uh, middle-class old houses as well. Okay, Brooks, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, just kind of a, Closing remarks, I, I would say uh, it's, it's refreshing to see that the uh, uh, people in the United States that have historic properties are recognizing the value of the historic windows and uh, recognizing the, the uh, authentic uh, work that can be done by restoring rather than replacing, uh, because it hasn't always been that way. And it's the, it's the right thing to do for the, for the building uh, and uh, for the uh, economic future of the structure. All right, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna ask my other um, um, members on the um, program here to turn their cameras back on. So when we come to question and answers, we'll have everyone's face. And a, a couple of them, uh, Ashley, uh, are being asked about what you were mentioning for the Georgetown uh, building. Uh, Elizabeth Sloan said, asked about, do you have specific sections of muttons that you approve for your windows? We'd like them to match what's being replaced. Okay. And what about, what about for new windows? Do you have any sort of guidelines for that? Are you trying to create some sort of historic profile? I'm curious what everybody has on this one. We've tried to sort of pull together what manufacturers are doing and figure out like who's making the best sort of reproduction mutton, and I do not have the answer right now, but I probably could get it and send it on and then we can disperse that. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with on the style, the, the style of the structure, the age of the structure, what kind of windows they have, uh, and that sort of thing as well. So it's, it's almost like it's unique to almost every historic building that you come across about the mutton profiles and things like that. Uh, Elizabeth Sloan is also asking, I think she was, when you were talking about the low E glass and the blueness of it, uh, in, the, in the project you were talking about, it would be a little more specific about true divided lights versus simulated divided lights. Uh, and what was that window made of? Was that a wood, brick, a wood window? That... I think what we were looking at was a clad window and it did have a true divided light, but it had two panes of glass. So that's why you had that thick extension sort of on the mutton. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'll let, I mean, Brooks and Dixon should throw themselves in here too, because they're working on this all the time, probably more than I am. With the low E, from what I understand, you can actually specify a less blue glass, but the standard has that very blue green tint to it. 
there, there are a select group of uh, manufacturers that uh, make a low E that's uh, very comparable to single pane glass from its visual light reflectance to the exterior and its tint. And those would be the only ones we would use on a national register project. The ones that we like, I mean, there's a number of, of different types you can get, but if you get the low E on a storm window, instead of having a, a film put on, you can have, have the low E made in the glass. And I think that would probably last longer. Okay. All right, for the next question, we might have to pull up, uh, Rio, we might have to pull up the slideshow again because it, it's asking a question about the, the standards number two and number five that Summer was, was presenting. So can we do that? You bet, just give me one second. Okay. And Summer, I believe this is a question for you. Yeah, I'm pulling up the question. Okay. So it asks, do standards number two and number five both apply or does each standard apply individually? So since I don't remember what number two and number five were, are we? So for the for a tax credit project where the, the standards are regulatory, all of the standards apply. Um, so you, would, you don't pick and choose. I mean, it, technically, usually if you meet standard two, you're probably meeting standard five. Um, but yeah, for the tax credit project, all, all 10 standards, um, it must be met. Okay. All right. So the, the, the standards that you presented are the ones that are really specific to windows. And the yeah. Because yeah, some of those standards deal with new construction or ground disturbance because of archaeology, things like that. So these are more specific to um, features such as windows. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. now, a couple of metal window questions. Uh, uh, how far can a repair shop go to straighten metal muttons and sashes that are racked in their opening and cannot operate? And what is the process for that repair? We, we prefer to uh, remove as many components as we can to bring back to our plant to do such restoration procedures. And uh, it, it, is, it is not difficult for us to replicate sections of muttons, styles and rails of sash, uh, frame componentry, and to weld in new components. Uh, where we've got pits in the steel, uh, we can use uh, special restoration epoxies to fill the pits. Um, most commonly what we see are removed muttons because uh, someone wanted to introduce a room air conditioner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, th that's a very typical repair. Another typical repair would be oh, uh, horizontal surfaces like sills and rails that, that uh, are subject to more water intrusion. Okay. Uh, the other question is how do you deal with condensation on historic non-thermally broken steel sashes? Well, if you've got a, uh, an interior storm window, uh, you can uh, effectively deal with the condensation. Uh, other, uh, other ways, if you don't have a storm window, uh, much of the condensation problems are due to airflow around the window itself and or the uh, proximity of heating uh, in the, uh, to the window. Uh, and uh, if you can manage those two elements, you can avoid interior condensation. Uh, the, the third element, of course, would be the relative humidity within the building itself. And uh, whenever we find condensation problems are usually because of high humidity, drapes or, uh, or blinds that are restricting the airflow to the window. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this one's more toward Dixon, uh, uh, and I like this one because I, I think it's uh, I think it's going to, to uh, speak to a lot of folks. Uh, I recently purchased a 1920s house. Uh, we have 30 original windows, all painted shut and cords cut. It isn't feasible for me to fully restore 30 windows. What should I prioritize? That's the difference between restore and repair. It sounds to me like that would be a repair job. Um, I would open the windows first, which is not that hard to do, even for a homeowner, and then re replace the cords. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, for, for you and me, I, that, th that seems to be a simple thing to do because we're familiar with that, but a lot of homeowners don't, don't understand the counterweight system. Okay. Um, there's actually an, um, a magazine article I wrote that tells the homeowner how to do that step-by-step, -step, how to 
take the window apart and get to the weight box and replace the cords. Um, it'd be kind of hard to do it on a Zoom. It's more of a workshop type of thing to learn from, but it, it, it could be done. Well, if you could uh, send Rhea a link to that article, that would be awesome because I think that sure. would be wonderful information. It surprises me how many people don't even know what the sash pocket is or that, that there's a weight inside there. Once, uh, once people find that out, they, they sort of enjoy doing this. I find that on their yeah. own house. Yeah, it's really cool when you get those windows. Work. Like you said, with two fingers, you make the window move up and down again with hardly any, any exerting any force, force at all. Yeah. Um, this next one's a little long. Let me let me read it real quickly. Um, let's see, I'm reglazing 35 year young windows, double hung. They're single glazing. A few of the sashes stick really bad. I really have to whack them with the heel of my hand sometimes if you're breaking them. WD-40 sprayed on the flexing on fluted aluminum side track helps. Is there something better to make this side slat, slat, slat sashes slide? Any sort of home remedy to make a window work better? It's, I think believe is what they're asking. Yeah, we, I, I tell people not to use wax or soap. It'll make them, it'll lubricate the window for a while, but then it'll pick up dirt and they'll lock up on you. The best thing they can do is go to the grocery store and get gulf wax. Um, it's like candles are made out of and 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 just rub it on the places that, that, that touch each other and it'll lubricate the windows. They'll go up really easy. Well, that's good to know because I always heard soap was a good thing to use. So that's it's, it's good when you first do it, but then it, it'll catch dirt. I'll be darned. Okay, super. This is great. I'm getting all sorts of good tips. Uh, another, we have another question about heat loss from historic single pane, double pane, uh, uh, hung glass. I, was, uh, I think we've addressed that with interior and exterior storm windows and things like that. Uh, okay, this is a good one. Uh, this might be for both Ashley and Summer. Who who can conduct the evaluation of historic windows? You can go one of two ways. You can have a preservation architect like Greg or myself do it, or you can have um, you can have the contractors come directly and have them look at it as part of where you're going. And they can, you know, I always like having I like having both usually because the contractors will give you tips and hints, and you know, eventually save you money because they're going to be putting bids on it. Yep. You. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with with that as well. We would accept um, evaluations from from both, um, and then maybe depending on the project um, and the detail of the windows, we may need additional survey work done. Um, maybe by people who do window re restoration, but um, initially, I think oftentimes just contractors working on the site is enough to give us the first level of detail that we need. Um, yeah. in, in my practice, we usually do our window survey for a building that we're doing, you know, the preservation plan for, uh, and then so much time lapses from the time we do that to the time the actual construction happens that we actually have the contractor to take our window survey and sort of verify it as well. Okay. So we have, you know, the, the initial survey and then we have a verifiable, uh, verified survey by the person who's actually going to do the ruin and restoration, which actually, as you mentioned, they give you all these great ideas and tips. Uh, if you'll bear with me for two minutes, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Uh, and it was about a steel window restoration that we were doing. Uh, and we did just that. We did our window restoration plan. Uh, it was about a year before the construction started. We asked the contractor to verify our window restoration plan, submit photographs of all the windows and things like that. And I get it. And I'm going through it. And I'm like, OK. Okay, okay, and then I was like, wait a minute. He had photographed the same window over and over and over and over. And the only reason I knew it was because there was a reflection of a case of bug light in the background. <laughs> the only reason I caught it. Oh, Here's a, here's a one, here's one. Uh, if there's no weather stripping on the original wood window, is it okay to add when the windows are repaired? I think Dixon, you might've brought that up with the product you're talking about to add for weather stripping. What, what, what do you feel about that? First of all, I don't like weather stripping and storm windows. You can get a wood window too tight. It needs to breathe some. I don't mean cold air blowing in, but it needs to breathe. Otherwise you get mold and mildew and then later rot. Um, 
can you, it depends on uh, the type of weather stripping they're talking about. The type that we use is a snap-on uh, tubular uh, weather stripping. There's also the, the um, bronze leaf that a lot of people use. I've never cared for it, but you can take that off and replace it. Really? You don't care for the bronze? Not on windows. Okay. I just never have. Interesting. Okay. Good. Um, that's interesting to know. Um, okay. I think we have a few other questions in here, but I think we've asked them. I just think, don't think they've just been moved to the answer column yet. Uh, but we still have a few minutes. We're running a little, a little fast, which surprises me. I thought we'd take the entire hour and a half. Um, but uh, if some more questions come in while I'm closing up here, uh, we'll be glad to address them. First of all, I want to thank everybody who participated today. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your knowledge and your expertise uh, with not only me and the rest of our, our panelists, uh, but with the public at large. And I'm sure they, they had a, a, a really informative presentation today. So again, thank you all so very, very much. Um, and as Rhea said, she will be sending out an email uh, uh, with uh, inform more information about the presentation and sort of the conclusion uh, and where you can get um, uh, some uh, links to uh, other information that was presented in the, uh, dur during the today's program. Uh, let me just ch check for any last questions. There are a couple, Greg, and, and apologize if you answered these and I, I missed it. Um, and can we treat with chemical process in situ, um, like epoxy thermal process? I would think that that'd be a question for both Dixon and Brooks uh, in some form or fashion um, about being able to treat windows in situ instead of taking them out. Treat windows what? In place without taking them out. Well, we've talked about doing repair instead of restoration in place. Is that what you mean? I mean, is it, is it possible to do like say um, epoxy repairs without taking the sash out? Depends on what the repair is. Okay. And where it is. Okay. Yeah, I would think but just uh, down the corner of the window, it'd be almost impossible to do it. But if, you know, a little rot on the side of the style, you could probably do that pretty easily in place. Or on the bottom. We, we prefer to do as much of that activity in our plant where we've got all the equipment, machinery, and processes in place. But you're going to spend time on site doing field restoration of uh, window frames uh, and our sash that can't be removed. And uh, in, in that case, you are using chemicals. You're using uh, caustic strippers in some case to remove finishes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so all of the protocols uh, associated with that and uh, lead paint and or asbestos uh, need to be followed and, and they are easily recognizable. And most uh, anyone that's in the business uh, attends to that uh, very effectively. Uh, you also have the restoration epoxies and or finishes that, uh, that uh, are applied in the field too. Um, and some of those can be caustic as well. But, uh, uh, any window restoration professional has uh, navigated those waters effectively. So, Very good. I, I think this is the most perfect question to end the program on. Uh, I love it. Working in historic preservation, this is for all of us, okay? Working in historic preservation, do you all also have an outside interest in history? I do. You know, you know that's really funny because my major in college was a double major in economics and then history. And uh, so I truly found my calling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Rhea, uh, since we're going to be wrapping up a little early, um, Will the webinar be open for questions till 1.30 or will it be shut? Will we go ahead and close it down? Well, I think if we have answered all the questions from our audience, we can go ahead and wrap up. And of course, um, uh, I do see just one or two more in the chat before we maybe okay. would want to close. So I can I can share those with you. Mm -hmm. And then um, of course, if anybody thinks of a question uh, following this session, you can always, email me. Um, you will have seen an email coming from me with reminders and, and things like that for this um, uh, webinar. I'll drop my um, email address in the chat as well. 
um, and we can connect you with our experts. But um, from the from the chat, uh, here is a question from one of our audience members: How can we stop the predatory replacement window salespeople I constantly see in my Fredericksburg historic district? They tell folks their product is fine, and since you don't need a permit to replace windows, they get in trouble later with our ARB. Do you have any tips or suggestions for sort of combating this? Um, pretty per pervasive problem. Ashley, do you have any suggestions working with your board? I mean, sadly, the answer is education, right? It's a refined eye. Like those of us who recognize how beautiful and long lasting the historic window is, it just seems like a crime. It's like a preservation crime to take the window out. And so hopefully in your neighborhood, you all can talk to each other and sort of point that out or appreciate like the reason we live there is because it's so beautiful. And that's one of the things we're admiring. I, I know for the districts that our board here in Norfolk oversees, we send out an annual letter to every homeowner in the district saying you are in a historic district. Uh, these are the, these are the rules and regulations you have to follow. And if you do these kinds of repairs to your house, you have to go before the ARB. So that's one of the ways we handle it here in Norfolk with the districts that we regulate. I, just, I wanna add in something we mentioned before, which is it's not just the high end homes. Those are actually the most susceptible because those people have money. And so they're looking at what to, how to spend it. But in the communities where you can't afford to replace your windows, and so they're not thinking about it, that's where the windows get preserved. And so it, it's actually sort of interesting that a lot of the um, more intact communities are the ones who can't afford to change. That's true. That is true. All right, well, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, any, any other uh, questions in the chat, Rhea? Um, I'm not sure if you've addressed this one, so I apologize if you've seen it already. Um, metal window question. So I, I think this is for you, Brooks. How far can a repair shop go to straighten um, uh, metal sashes and, and windows that have racked in their openings and cannot operate? What's a process for that repair? Did you answer that already? Yes, we did. Oh, okay. My apologies. I just no did not dismiss it. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, do any of the preservation regulations have less restrictive standards for windows at the back of the house, which are not visible? Just speaking for the Norfolk ARB, we, we concentrate on what's visible from the public right of way. And then for the tax credit pro program, we're looking at all sides of the, the building. Um, and, and one other final one, and this may be, um, I think maybe for, for a couple of folks here, do you accept recreated wood windows? So I guess um, uh, maybe Dixon and, and Ashley that, uh, and uh, Summer might want to answer that. You're towards Summer uh, with the, with the uh, tax credit program. Yeah, so we reconstructed windows. Again, we're looking kind of at the drawings that I, that I was showing. We're gonna wanna see that whatever new window is proposed, um, can adequately uh, replicate that historic window. So um, that we've definitely approved projects where windows are being um, rebuilt. Um, again, we're just looking at, at the level of detail that they're able to produce. And from an architectural standpoint, I actually use craftspeople like Dixon and um, Brooks even for new, like if it's a new building, because I think the newly created old window or the newly created window done by hand with the old techniques is far superior to anything you can buy on the market. And so I think it's a very good way to go. There are a number of shops in Virginia that can make traditional windows um, like you want them. They can do, um, they can work with old growth wood that's been recycled. Lots of times the shops will, will rebuild those windows and send them to me to put old glass in them. So it's, it's a traditional window made just like the one that came out of it if it's done well. We, we do a lot of that custom wood fabrication uh, where we'll take sections from the existing window system. And, uh, and that is the basis of design for the replica. Uh, so like at the College of William and Mary, we did a dormitory where they wanted to replace their windows and uh, we manufactured weight balanced uh, hung windows made of a Koya 
which is a wood that has a 50 year warranty with no finishes applied to it. So it's as durable as the old growth. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's a common practice, uh, but uh, you've got to pay attention to all the details because it's, uh, it's an exact facsimile of the existing, just using more modern products. And I got, I've got one more thing from the Q&A that I just thought that all of our panelists ought to hear. Um, uh, uh, I was almost ready to replace my sticking double hungs until watching this program. I have repented. Thank you. <laughs> it was worth it. Better job. Better job today. It's fantastic. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.